All right. Now I know that this thing is still up. Right, right here, right here, folks. All right, right here. Now, there are 10 things I want you to know. By the way, when you see the map, it looks somewhat like this, but you can always flip it over, you know. So 10 things I want you to identify. Here they are North America, Italy, Greece, India, India, uh, China, South America, Arabia, Israel, Africa, and Rome. Israel, Now, folk, especially with me giving you what to look for, now this might seem too simple for college students. And actually, I'll be honest, I think it is. However, the reason I picked these 10 is before the semester's out, we're going to be talking about all 10 places. And hopefully, you can look at a world map. And I mean, I know this map is turned the wrong way. And say, hey, you know, this is Italy. Now, again, you'd be surprised at how many college students cannot do that. For some of you, this is too simple. Hey, you know, you know, anybody know what this is? South America. South America. And, uh, oh yeah, right here. This one is some, a lot of scholars students give. What's this? Arabia. Arabia, and of course, near right next to Arabia is Israel. This is Italy. Uh, this is Greece right here. Again, we're going to be starting to talk about Greece today. All right. Again, those of you who are here can see that, and the ones of you who aren't. That's their hard look. <laughs> yeah, I had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get here. So. I know there are, there are some times when absences can't be helped. All right, anybody have any, do I need to say anything more about this? All right, then we gotta, we got to move on. Okay. Um, all right, Greece. All right, uh, yeah, okay, I've taken 30 minutes already. This is important. How do we find those symposiums that you just worship? Okay, uh, well, uh, they're posted on the walls of the uh, hallways, particularly that one about the 60s. They should be on your email. Apparently, if they're not, I gave, I gave out a paper, I mean, on my, on my, on my webpage, you know, I, I call it. There is some that tells about some of them. And several of you have attended. Those, they meet at the Methodist Church on Thursdays. Uh, so I did it. Otherwise, you go to the student center and they're posted on the bulletin boards there. And I don't know why you're not getting them in your email. All right. But in other words, you can find out as where the symposium is. I believe you can if you look hard enough. Okay. Chapter four. And we're going to spend more time with Greece and Rome than we have the other chapters. So your next big test. Oh yeah. A bunch of you will be getting notices in your email about. Uh, about uh, pass, particularly those of you who have not done well in my test to be getting pass notices. If you do, you need to see me, see your advisor, talk it over um, why, are not do why are you not doing so well. And folk, I don't believe it's because my tests are too hard. Now, the next test, which will be on chapters four and five, Greece and Rome, will be the multiple choice format. I mean, I heard students make the excuse, I don't do well on multiple choice tests. I give it a word test, fill in. I hear the same thing. I just don't remember that well. Anything you do can be wrong. And again, the results, well, if anything, I will say this. You're doing better on this test, these two tests, than, than my students did on the multiple choice test. And why is that? Because with multiple choice, it's easy to give, or go for a wrong answer. And I'll tell you something about that. I've given true false tests. And at some time, on a true false test, there's one question that only one student missed. Mm. So look up who missed that easy question. Guess what? It's usually an A plus student who thought it was too easy and got faked out. So if I, if I were to give a true false test, 
I'd probably wind up putting a curve because everybody, even the A students, would wind up getting faked out by an easy question or two, and the highest score would be 90. Um, but again, again, the results are pretty much the same, regardless of what type of testing. The same students are going to make the same grades regardless. All right, Greece. Um, Greece is uh, a very mountainous country, and these mountains kept Greece from uniting. Here is the problem. I mean, the mountains are tall and rugged, unlike Italy's mountains, which are lower and easier to cross. In the case of Greece, if one city-state decided to try to conquer another city-state, they'd have to go across a really high, jagged mountain, and on the way up, they'd lose a bunch of their men to sickness and lose their equipment. On the way down, a bunch of the men would probably fall or get hurt, descending or whatever. By the time the army reached the enemy, a good fraction of its equipment and men would have been lost. So this enabled the defensive people to have more, uh, more of advantage. And this kept the Greek city-states from uniting. Now, yeah, I'm going to use the word city-state. Another word for that is polis. Polis is uh, the Greek term for a city and its surrounding countryside. Now, with all these cities, most of them had walls, and they were surrounded by a countryside where the people were farmers. And in time of invasion, the farmers could then flee to the city walls for safety and get protection there. Of course, their crops might be ruined by the time they got out. But you had the, the polis, the Greek person's life centered around this polis. And the polis would be a temple dedicated to their patron god. In the case of Athens, the patron god was Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And in the case of Sparta, their patron god was Mars. And hey, if you didn't get this, I have more to say about it. When we come to Greek religion, Mars was a god of war. But they had their uh, cities... And um, the surrounding countryside made up the polis, where the Greek person would be born, grow up, marry, have children, and die, almost always within the same uh, polis. From that word polis, we get the word like uh, metropolis. Um, that word is sometimes spelled P-O-L-I-S. Anyway, we get to um, where my dad grew up in a town called Poiopolis, Minneapolis. Again, it comes to the Greek word for city. Now, backing up to the beginning, your chapter opens up with a story of Pericles. In fact, it shows a picture of Pericles, and before the next class is out, I will have had a lot to say about Pericles. So you, better, you better remember that name. The occasion is at the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, Athens took time to honor its war dead. And Pericles made a great speech talking about how great and wonderful democracy is. Um, this was at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War when the Athenians thought they had a chance to win. Now, as we talk more about the Peloponnesian War, you're going to learn that Athens lost, democracy lost, to uh, Sparta and its organization. Now, in the short run, Athens lost. Fast forward to the year 2015, Athens has at least two million people, and Sparta is nothing but a bunch of rocks. And there are, anyway, Sparta is a ghost town, dead. But in the short run, Athens could not whip Sparta. And they have a little bit of bad luck. We'll get to that in a bit. All right. With the Greeks, for the first time, we have democracy democracy, skepticism. and something that resembles a constitution 
something we have not seen in the ancient world before this time. Um, skepticism over some Greeks, not all, began to question the existence of the gods. Constitution, or that's where a written document governs you, more so than the person. Now, granted, a written document cannot deal with individual situations, but um, everybody supposedly obeys the written document as best they can. And uh, life goes on under the document, not under the rule of uh, any one person. Democracy, again, that's where the, everybody has a chance to vote, choose their leaders, and choose their laws. We find this among the Greeks. Now, early Greek history. The oldest Greek we know about is the Minoan. The Minoan civilization, and they were not Greek. They lived on an island in the Mediterranean, the island of Crete. And folk, I'm going to be saying this again, I'm going to say it now, I've already said it before. It appears that the Minoan civilization was very, very highly advanced. Their palaces were large. We do have some of their writings, and uh, we are able to read them. Whatever else you can say about it, they were not Greek. They did not speak a Greek language. Where they came from then, we don't know, but they're an early people who, and they, they did have trade with Sumer. We find Sumerian artifacts in Minoan, in, on Crete. We find Minoan artifacts in Sumer, indicating that they had a network of trade and they seem to have been advanced, and they seem to have come to a sudden abrupt end, possibly as a result of a tsunami or tidal wave. Now, we've heard of a tsunami just about five or six years ago that killed, um, that killed millions of people in one, just one blast. Tidal wave is where the ocean comes up over the water, and um, it's happened many a time. It's believed that the earthquakes that they had in those days and the tidal waves were worse then than they are now. That the, uh, it's believed by some anyway. That the earth had not stabilized. Now again, folk, I'm finding out a lot of you don't believe that there was a flood. I'm going to have more to say about that when you turn your papers in on Monday. But some people believe that there really was a flood. And that after the flood, the earth was much more unstable than it is now. And a big tidal wave just swept over the entire island of Crete and wiped all of them out in one swoop. And uh, since there were no significant survivors, there might have been a few. The, uh, the story of the island of Crete going underwater might have given rise to the ancient legend of Atlantis, which we'll talk about later in connection with Plato. Plato described a very highly advanced people who all of a sudden sunk under the sea. And it has led to all kinds of people looking for Atlantis. There have been many, many books written about it, location where it might have been. Um, many attempts to find it. Some people think they know. Anyway, the Minoans had a sudden catastrophic collapse. I say that the Minoan civilization was long located on the island of Crete. Some of it apparently reached the Greek mainland also. The Minoans gave way to the Mycenaeans. <laughs> now, the Mycenaeans, we now know, were Greek. At first, we didn't think so. But now we know that they were Greek, which leads us to raise the question, where did they come from? All right. The Mycenaeans came from Indo-Europe, probably the area around the Caucasians, and I've already mentioned how that around 1800 BCE, and we don't know why, perhaps pushed down by like climate change, you know, it was a global cooling, the Mycenaeans, I mean, the, yeah, the, the Greeks, Mycenaeans, came and settled in, Greeks, in Greece, the Latins were settled in Rome, the Medes and Persians settled in what is today Iran, and of course on 
another group, the Aryans settled in India, Northwest India. But uh, this chapter we talk about these people. Next chapter talk about the Latins who settled in Italy. The Mycenaeans settled in um, in um, Greece, took over, and apparently mixed in pretty well with the original inhabitants, what few of them there were, and they may have driven them out. But again, it's a story we're finding repeated many a time throughout history where they, you have a group of people living in a certain place, then comes another group of people who moves in. Sometimes they enslave the original inhabitants, sometimes they drive them out. Most recently this happened here in our own continent where the, we had American Indians living here. Now then came the Europeans and drove the Indians out, or in some, or at least in some cases made them hide, or in some cases put them on reservations. I mean, you know, folk, this is what people have done all the way down through the ages, all the way down through time. Um, and uh, in the case of the Mycenaeans, they settled. Now, they wrote in a script called Linear B, and I am particularly interested because my first graduate paper involved the Linear B script, but my, actually, the paper was on Linear A. Linear A was the script that the Minoans wrote, and it has not been deciphered. And uh, I mean, I wrote my paper about uh, 43 years ago you know, when I was at the University of Tennessee. It hadn't been deciphered, and since then I've looked it up. And the problem we have with deciphering linear A is there is simply not enough writing to attempt it. Now, again, in today's world, if you can get a lot of ancient writing, you can eventually make a breakthrough. But now, linear B was another matter. We found a lot of linear B scripts. And what hindered us from deciphering it was, everybody knew it wasn't Greek, so why check it out with Greece, with Greek, right, with Greek, the Greek language. Well, World War II broke out, and people, particularly the English, hired a lot of people to crack the German code. And you may know that during the war we were in on a German code, we knew every word that we were going to be all the time. We also broke the Japanese code, we knew everything the Japanese planned to do, and guess what, we whipped them. And I will say this, I was in the combo unit when I was in the Army, and our government changes its code every day. If the enemy gets today's code, it's no good tomorrow. But the Germans and Japanese during the war used the same code throughout the war. Huge mistake. Anyway, now what's this have to do with Greece? Simply this, when the war was over, some of these experts who had learned how to crack languages began to study Linear B, and one of them figured out, hey, this Linear B script is actually Greek. And at first, they said, no, no, it, well, the Greeks weren't there. Then they finally realized, yes, the Linear B script is Greek. Now, the Greeks did not continue writing Linear B. Linear B is a very difficult script to learn. Eventually, eventually the Phoenicians came in and they taught the Greeks the alphabet. Now, I've already mentioned this, but nevertheless, it bears repeating. The Phoenicians and the Greeks simply quit using Linear B and began to use uh, Linear A. Now, um, what we know about the Mycenaeans, they were a warrior people. They prided themselves on, his, on um, valiant deeds in battle. This was to eventually keep the Greeks though from advancing any higher. They spent a lot of their time fighting among themselves. They could not unite. Even though it is believed, it is believed that during the Mycenaean age, they may have been all united into one big country. But then in historic times after Mycenaean age, they simply could not unite. Now, we come to a period of time called the Greek Dark Age. We're going to run into this term again in the context of European history. The word dark age, when applies to when applied to history, means that it's a period where we modern people don't have a lot of historical records about it. Now, it's not that it was dark. During this time, we know that they had they had people grow up, young boys and girls grew up, they had more children. Um, life went on, they farmed, they fought. 
everything that people do. We don't know any detail much about them because if they wrote anything down, it was all left behind. Then around 750 BCE, um, the Greeks got the, the Phoenician alphabet and Greek history starts again. However, um, we do know that during the Dark Age, a lot of Greeks left the island of Greece and they began to fan out all over. They went to Italy, Cyprus, Crete, Asia Minor, in other words, Turkey. Asia Minor, what's that called Asia Minor today? It was then called, it's now called Turkey. What was then called Asia Minor is now called Turkey. And it's been known as Anatolia and a few other names. But the Greeks began to colonize, and part of this is due to the fact that the land in Greece is very, very difficult to farm. It's mostly rocky, mountainous. The mountains mean that the sun doesn't shine in the valleys very much. And um, they do manage to grow olives, but the fact is they have a very difficult time uh, growing anything. And again, uh, this led to people, there was a limit to how much population they could support. Now today, we have better methods of fertilizing the land and better methods of farming. And the Greek, well, the main land can support a lot more people. But in those days, Greece, had a difficult time supporting his people, so his people moved out. Now we come to something, a name that you've already run into before, Homer. That is, those of you who have done your assigned work. All right, Homer. Homer lived during this time we call the Dark Age, and of all the writings, his is like the only one that has survived because it was copied and recopied. In Greek, Folklore, Homer was a blind poet who wrote two works. I'm going to, the Iliad You may notice I wrote it in cursive. If you were writing it, you should write it in italics because it's the name of literary work. Um, I L I A D or Odyssey O D Y S S E Y. The Iliad is a story about the uh, war that mainland Greece fought with Troy. Um, yeah, the city of Troy. The war was started when the uh, Helen of Troy was uh, raped uh, by uh, someone high up in the Greek society, and a lot of the Greeks did not like it, so they went to war with, to get vengeance on Helen, and uh, or vengeance on behalf of Helen. Anyway, the war lasted 10 years and ended with the destruction of Troy. Now I'm gonna come back to the Iliad, but then the Odyssey takes up where the Iliad left off. When the war was over, and these men started to go home, they got on board a ship, a strong wind blew the ship off course, and they had all kinds of adventures and misadventures. But after 10 years, Odysseus, the king, finally arrived home. Um, but during that time, he went, he, he, actually, he went to, ran into all kinds of monsters, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things that we today would call weird. Now, For many years, we considered these stories to be legend. In fact, we still do. And this is the topic of your first assignment, if you have, for those of you who have done it. And I want to say this, I've had a much better response on persons doing the assignment this semester than I have had any other semester that uh, I've taught as far as persons doing the assignment early. Anyway, we eventually, though, at least found the city of Troy. Um, the Homeric poems did not tell us where Troy was exactly, but they gave us hints. I mean, folk would be like, if you read a, a modern story and they mention New York, the authors are not going to describe to you where New York City is, or likely won't. They assume you already know. 
Well, if you talk about a big snowstorm in Massachusetts, well, hey, the, the weathermen assume you already know where Massachusetts is. In the case of the Greeks, they assumed you knew, but nevertheless, uh, in the 1700s, an archaeologist studied the Iliad really carefully and came to the conclusion that he could find Troy, and he went, he found it. And it is true that the last time Troy was inhabited was burned. Actually, there were about five or six times that Troy was built, was destroyed, built again. It was burned down to the ground at least two or three times. But finally, it was burned to the ground and never rebuilt. The story of about the Battle of Troy features a fellow named Achilles. In the story of Achilles, a god told Achilles' his mother, this man is going to die in battle. And Achilles' his mother was determined, well, no, no, he won't. So finally, God said, well, I'll tell you what, dip your baby in the river Styx and he'll be invulnerable. Well, she dipped him in the river Styx except for one heel that she didn't quite submerge. And Achilles grew up and became a very mighty warrior and nobody could hurt him. But finally, somebody noticed when he stepped on a rock that his heel bled. So uh, this person, the person got wind of this and shot Achilles in his heel with a poison arrow and Achilles died. Again, this is an example of Greek literature, which we'll talk about later for next time. That what the gods have decreed is going to be, and every attempt we make to prevent it is not going to work. Um, that you cannot change. Now again, folks, let me hasten to say, I'm teaching about these beliefs. In no way do I, expel, do I expect you to believe them yourself unless you choose to. I'm not pushing these beliefs. But nevertheless, I must mention fatalism because it is a big part of Greek literature. And it also was a big part of Chinese literature and has been a big part of a lot of people's lives down through the ages. I believe that we are helpless to control our own destiny, that we have no say so in what happens to us. Um, Achilles is just one of many stories. Stories how that the gods aided first one side, then another. But eventually, after ten years of fighting, the Greeks told the Trojans, we give up. But here's our gift to you, and it was a great big wooden horse on wheels. So the Trojans opened up their gates and wheeled the wooden horse inside, unaware that inside the horse were a bunch of Greek soldiers. In the meantime, the rest of the Greek army turned and left Troy, and the, Troy, the Trojans believed the war was over. But once the Greek army had gotten out of sight and dark darkness fell, the Greek soldiers turned around and went back to Troy. In the meantime, the Greeks who were inside a horse went to the city gate of Troy and opened up the gate from inside to let all the buddies in. And they sacked Troy and set it on fire. And supposedly Troy has never been rebuilt, was never rebuilt after that. Again, now, a point I want to make about the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Odyssey features, among other things, a one-eyed cyclops. Uh, and met monster with only one eye, and they put that eye out. Uh, it was a man-eating monster. It also features a bunch of female warriors called Amazons who would, uh, could outdo any men in battle. Again, now, I'm gonna talk, have, have any of you read these stories? Uh, about two or three hands went up. Okay, well, anyway, you should run into these stories in literature classes. The Greeks considered these stories folk to be serious history. And they memorized them. I mean, they read them and reread them and reread them and memorized them. It was said that Alexander the Great would never go to sleep unless he had a copy of the Iliad and Odyssey under his pillow. But it was the last thing he'd read himself to sleep. I mean, folk and I have gotten sleepy many a time reading. And uh, yes, I've read myself to sleep many a time. I gave you, and I do sometimes have a sleeping problem, and uh, I will go to sleep reading sometimes, or go to sleep listening to a uh, YouTube presentation or something similar, uh, something on the, my computer. But anyway, um, the Greeks would memorize these long, long, long poems, and they believed them down to the last detail. Again. You can decide for yourself, does it show a primitive mentality? All of the ancients 
started off their history with stories like the ones I'm telling you, stories that involve giants, monsters, strange types of people, half human and half beast, particularly the centaur, half human and half horse. All their stories began with this, these stories. Um, and nobody seems to have questioned it now. About it. Now one thing though about Homer, a lot was said in the Homeric uh, poems about courage. The Greeks believed strongly in courage on the battlefield, facing up to whatever your fate decreed, and facing it without flinching, without a whimper. However, what was lacking in the stories was an attitude of cooperation. And because Homer did not talk about cooperation, the Greeks did not develop any attitude at this time about cooperation or community, loyalty. Loyalty to your city-state, yes. Loyal to be Greek, no. Now, in our own history, we have an example where that the southern people believed that their first loyalty lay with their state. And that's why men like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson chose to fight for the Confederacy, even though supposedly neither one of those men believed in slavery. Stonewall Jackson especially did not believe in slavery. But he believed the state of Virginia was more important than the federal government. The Greeks believed their own local police, their own local city-state, was more important to them than the overall Greek uh, area. So, um, now, In the course of their fighting, they developed a type of fighting called hoplite. Here's what made it necessary. The Greek, only a few Greek men had horses. Again, owing to the fact that the Greek um, land was so very non-productive, Horses would eat so much of what little food there was, or what little straw and hay there was, that only the richest of men could afford horses. So most of the wars then were fought by foot soldiers. The Greeks eventually learned how to um, line up an army that would help to keep down a number of casualties. And they would line it up to where, and now, again, you may have noticed, I'm left-handed, but I'm going to pretend right now that I'm right-handed. They would put their shield on their left hand, but instead of their shield protecting Himself. Their shield was held out here to protect the man next to them. With their right hand, they would fight. In the meantime, they would have their buddy's shield protecting them, but they would swing their sword with their right hand while their buddy over here was swinging his sword with his right hand. And they would fight as a unit. Now, the purpose of this was to guarantee that you never fought an individual hope light. You had to fight the whole team. They would march into battle where their shields line up wall to wall, and if uh, they line up sometimes four or five deep, so you line up, and then behind you would be a second line. If the man up front fell down in battle, the second man was to step up and take his place as quickly as he could. And uh, then if the second man fell, the third man would take his place. Now, the problem that these armies had they would often tend to go to the right. In other words, a person fighting was felt threatening. He might just crouch a little bit to the right, which would pull his buddy to the right. They tended to go to the right. And also, they had another big weakness. I mean, you'd have this line of shields. If you could get around their flank, get around their back, you could beat them. You could whip them. So they would have a, the flankings, the side, protected by some of their best troops to make sure that the enemy was kept up front and the enemy never got behind. Now, they eventually people learned how to uh, how to do this. Now this, in the history of warfare, warfare has undergone many changes, but in the history of warfare, the whole light was doomed to uh, failure. Number one, it did not work well when Europeans developed a, a lot of horsemen, the night, particularly the night, armored night. And, uh, when armies got larger also, the whole pipe would only work with smaller armies. When armies got larger, the soldiers in the front could not hear the commands of the commanding officer. 
but as long as armies were fairly small, and it, is, it kept down a number of casualties, and that you could fight and lose fewer men than you would if you uh, fought with any other conventional means. So, hope light also, uh, the hope light is important to the development of democracy because the aristocrats, in order to get the common man to be more willing to fight for them, would promise to, if we win, I'll give you this, or if we win, I'll give you more say so in the government, particularly. Um, and the, this led to the common man becoming more important than he otherwise would have been because the aristocrats, the wealthier people, needed his services. So the Hope Lights was uh, not just uh, military, but also had a civilian function. Now your book shows on page 98 two Hope Light armies going into battle with shields kind of overlapping each other side by side. And a director, a flute person uh, directing the fight, uh, everybody learned the notes of the flute. Uh, the player played a certain note, you would advance, and the flute player played another certain note, you would retreat. Um, Oh yeah, the uh, formation was called a phalanx. Don't worry about that term. But do you remember the word hope light? Um, anyway, the uh, Greeks continued to uh, expand, and as they did, they um, would leave Greece and fan out and spread out all over the Mediterranean. And again, particularly, they would spread into Crete, Italy, Cyprus and Turkey, and maybe even north into Macedonia and uh, what is today Serbia, but they tended to fan out because their own land would become so unproductive. And uh, they would oftentimes not forget their homeland, but they would trade with their old homeland, um, trade what they grew, their products they grew for things made in Greece. All right. Which takes us up to uh, the, what a lot of Greek philosophers would say happened. They would start off with a monarchy. Now this is government here. The word monarch generally means ruled by a hereditary king who got power by somehow maybe being chosen or usurping the power. And when he dies, he passes it on to his son. The monarchy would oftentimes give way to an oligarchy Or sometimes called an aristocracy, where that a few of the wealthier people, you know, when they got rid of the monarch, they would replace it with a mon an oligarchy, where a few of your wealthier people would uh, govern. Then, after the oligarchy would it would give way to a tyranny. Now, in today's world, we think of a tyrant as being an evil person. The Greeks did not have that connotation. A tyrant, a tyrant, was simply one man who took over out of a chaotic situation and brought order out of chaos. And he would oftentimes make all kinds of improvements, but he would take over by getting a bunch of the right uh, common people on his side, or maybe for the right oligarchs, and say, hey, we can't stand this rule by several people. We need to know who's in charge. So, uh, you know, this is ruled by one, but he's hereditary. This is ruled by one, but he's not hereditary. And then the Greeks, Last of all, it would become a democracy. Now, okay, folk, I must say this. The Greeks looked on democracy as being the absolute worst form of government that you could have. What was wrong with democracy? All right. In their minds, democracy inevitably led back to either this or this. In every case where we have a story of Greek democracy, the same thing happened to Rome. Sooner or later, one man was to take over and straighten out the mess. Democracy led to chaos. This, now this is their view. And the chaos just cried out for one man, please come in and straighten out the mess. Democracy oftentimes led to a high crime rate, but even worse perhaps than the high crime rate was the attitude that the common people could dip their hand in the public pot. Now, we have a philosopher in modern times who said that our modern democracies will work until the common people find out they can dip their hand in the public pot. 
And now the question is, who said that? I looked it up for reason nobody knows. Suppose he was a Scottish philosopher. When he looked it up in his writings, he can't find them. But somebody said it was said by a certain Scottish philosopher. I once heard Plato said it, but again, no, it wasn't Plato. You know, Plato said it in so many words. But eventually what happens with democracy is along comes a politician who tells the common people, hey, elect me and I'll give you this from the public treasury. I will give you public welfare. I'll make sure that none of you starve. Elect me and you'll have all kinds of great and wonderful programs. So what happens? The whole system winds up crashing down and they run out of other people's money to spend. Any of you know what I'm talking about? And folk, we see that happening today. Anyway, they again, democracy was to get, to get a bad name that it was not to live down for hundreds of years. All right. Um, now, which takes us up to Sparta. When I was a kid, even as young as the sixth grade, I mean, I had a love for history then, but I couldn't help but think that the war between Sparta and Athens reminded me of the Cold War that was going on at the time between the United States and the Soviet Union, with Sparta being the Soviet Union and Athens being the United States. However, in ancient history, Sparta and Athens fought a war, and I've already mentioned, so I'll mention again. Sparta won, which was kind of hey, just shaking. You know, hey, how come the bad guys won? Well, the bad guys won in a short run. Today, there are 200 people living in isolation of mountains, they're mostly goat farmers, who claim that they're descended from the Spartans. That's all that's left Sparta. Otherwise, the city itself, nothing but a stone heap, stone ruins. All right, but back to the time period we're talking about. Sparta was located on a, a land that was very unproductive. So what they wound up doing was they take, took over Messenia and they enslaved Messenian people. They called these slaves Hellots. And they kept these people enslaved for hundreds of years. The Hellots then provided the Spartans the food that they needed. And the Spartans, in turn, provided the Hellots with practically nothing. The Spartans were told, you must work for us. Well, to, keep, to make sure that the Hellots did not revolt, Sparta changed, transformed itself into one big military camp. In other words, every boy was born to be a soldier. Now, where do I start? Well, I'll start with the boys. When they were born, and the girls too, when a baby was born to a Spartan couple, the baby was allowed to live for one month, and after one month, Spartan doctors would examine the baby, whether it be a boy or a girl. If the baby did not appear to be healthy, the parents were told to take it out, drop it off, and let the wild animals eat it. This is called exposing babies. Now, this is something that we're going to run into again when we talk about Roman history. This was common in place in the ancient world, where the parents did not want a child. They'd simply take it out and drop it off. A few of these exposed babies are known to have survived. Maybe the right person found them, or would, uh, they happened to find good fortune. But basically, only the best were allowed to grow up. Then at six years old, the bad boy was taken from his parents and put into a camp. And there he received military training that was extremely rigorous. Every boy was whipped publicly at least once a year. Whipping was considered a main part. They were not given enough food. They were given just maybe a, a little bit of food and told they had to steal the rest. And if they were caught stealing, they were whipped. There was a story of one Spartan boy who captured a fox. And then on his way to eat the fox, he, had to, he was going to kill the he, he ran into his, some army officers, and they tried his best to hide the fox. So in the meantime, the fox was nibbling at him, but he would not. He concealed the fox very well. He finally got the army officers shaken off and told him he was up to, not up to anything bad. 
went and killed a fox, but this time he was permanently disfigured because of the amount of eating the fox had done, or gnawing the fox had done on his stomach. Um, a lot of Spartan boys did not survive the rigorous training and died before they became of age. At 20, they joined the Spartan army as a soldier, having done nothing else but learn soldiering. Now, the Spartans did not want anything in the way of art and music because they believed these made pe people soft. I will say this and I have to close. Sparta was the one and only city state that never experienced any kind of rebellion. That society was really structured and uh, the people apparently who knew nothing else liked it. I'll have a lot more to say about Sparta when we come back. But